So taking us through to lunch, we're going to be covering the Shasta Cold Water Pool Management. And Tom Patton from the US Bureau of Reclamation will be speaking. Tom's a hydraulic, hydrologic engineer with Reclamation Central Valley Operations Office based out of Sacramento, California, with over 30 years of experience in reservoir management and power operations. He has been involved in real-time reservoir operations, hydrological modeling, and power marketing during his time at Reclamation, uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the Western Area of Power Administration. Tom is currently the technical lead on day-to-day -day operations of the Northern California, Northern Central Valley project, which includes Shasta, Trinity, and Whiskey Town Reservoirs. So Tom, thanks for being here today. It's really sensitive, but I apologize, but it's people just going out over their ears if they don't tell them. Apparently, we're not as lively as you as whoever is back for lunch. Maybe we have to change that. <laughs> this presentation will do it, maybe. Uh, who knows? Um, I remember starting at the, my career at the Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, the old time engineer was said, uh, ah, it's, Operating reservoir is easy. You just add and subtract, you know. <laughs> Inflow minus outflow equals change in storage. There's nothing else to it, right? So I think things have changed over time, definitely. There's a there's definitely a lot to uh consider. So um we are in at the at the Bureau of Reclamation, our Central Valley project, there's just a small group of us. There's six engineers. Um Five of us are, you know, one boss and five engineers managing the system. So, and uh, we're actually, we're getting close to all getting, you know, up there in 20 plus years. And and uh, we're trying to think about succession planning. We're trying to bring in engineers. So that's my plug here is that anyone knows some young engineers, you know, let them know we're looking for people. So um, down the road, uh, we've got some good quality um, experience to kind of hang your hats on and uh, uh, teach the, you know, keep this thing going, try to help solve this problem. But uh, <laughs> All right, little background, uh, Sacramento River, Shasta Dam, uh, 11 miles north of Redding, world's, one of the world's largest uh, standing dams, the uh, biggest in California, four and a half million acre feet, and it's a multi-purpose project. So obviously flood control is a top priority, water supply, temperature management, and then power generation. I think some folks asked us yesterday, where's power generation in terms of the priority list? It's it's pretty far down there. So uh, we do the best we can. Uh, power gets what it gets. But uh, again, it's it's lower on the priority list in terms of uh, in the bigger picture. Uh, another big component, Northern System, Trinity Dam, um, 10 miles northeast of Weaverville, a little, much higher in elevation than Shasta. So uh, it's still pretty big, two and a half, two, 2.4 million acre feet. 
much higher in elevation, a lot bigger cold water pool. So in terms of temperature management on the Trinity, uh, not as big of an issue there, uh, but still a component. Um, you can see here in terms of uh, uh, the ability to bring uh, water down from Trinity Reservoir into uh, the diversion system, we can bring that water over from the Trinity River system into the Central Valley to help with water supply. But Trinity on its own also has uh, regulatory requirements for, for uh, temperature management, uh, both uh, primarily on the, on the Trinity itself. There's also, uh, it's gotten uh, more involved in Klamath operations as well as the Trinity empties into the Klamath before it empties into the ocean. And then there's Whiskey Town Lake. It's like a big diversion uh, uh, reservoir in between Trinity and Shasta. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of rec uh, recreation there because uh, we typically keep that lake uh, high all summer long. So uh, it's lowered a little bit to manage for flows in the wintertime and then raised up into the, the summertime. And then, uh, as you can see, we pass water from the Trinity system through Whiskey Town. We either empties into Clear Creek, which empties into the Sacramento River, or um, we can uh, generate power through out of Whiskey Town, which puts water into Keswick Reservoir, and then, and then to the Sacramento River. So, Here's my plug, probably final plug on last uh, in this presentation on hydropower. Um, so bringing water over from the Trinity system, there's a huge power benefit. Uh, really high in the reservoir, uh, powerhouse on the Trinity Dam, powerhouse at the car power plant as we bring that water through Whiskey Town and then out through Spring Creek into the Sacramento River. So huge amount of power benefits uh, coming from the Trinity system as it's diverted over to the second system. So setting the stage here, um, there's a, basically this slide just tells you there's a huge variability in inflow into Shasta. So that's, that's one of the major uh, issues where we have to deal with on a year to year basis. Uh, we, we have a, we're talking about planning horizons in CBO, 12 months is kind of that rolling 12 months is what we're focused on. So uh, trying to manage those the operational, um, all the operational uh, regulatory requirements in that 12 months, basically. Uh, we do look out into the, the current, the coming water year, but the focus is that current year and managing to all the requirements in that year. So huge variability between a, a wet year over 10 million acre feet and uh, a critical year, 77. And then you can see just more, more recently, 15, 16. And we don't, we didn't add on the, the most current droughts, but they're similar to the 15 and 16 drought. Uh, what are the characteristics for the cold water pool at, at Shasta? So just a kind of a general, uh, picture for you, winter time, nice and cool reservoir. Um, and then as the spring uh, warm weather starts to come, we got the upper layer of the lake starting to get warm. That cold water is uh, coming into the reservoir in the low end. And as we move through the summer, you have a stratified condition. And then in the fall, you can see things are, lake gets pretty warm. In the summertime, we can see close to 80 degrees at the surface. So nice when you jump in and swim around from that uh, uh, boat of yours, but uh, but uh, not good for the fish. So in terms of uh, what we're gonna do for the season, it, uh, it, it uh, we'll get, as we get further into the discussion, you can see where we've uh, come up with some, in, some engineering fixes to try to help help with that. So from a, a, just a snapshot on several years. So you can see we have wet years, dry years, and then this is kind of a picture of, of how that stratification occurs through the, through the seasonal period. So from year to year. Um, 
we can have a year like this where reservoir is full, but compared to last year, last year the reservoir is full, may not have as big of a cold water pool as last year. So not all full years are created equal. Yes. So um, what do we have to work with? We've got a, a selective withdrawal system that allows us to manage how we draw water out of the lake. At the same time, it goes to the powerhouse. So you can still, again, and this is the vision of the power customers way back in the in the 90s. Uh, uh, there, you want to keep generating power the best we can. It's good for everybody, right? So, but at the same time, we want to be able to withdraw colder water uh, from deeper in the reservoir. So selective withdrawal is the way to go. Here's a different picture of that. So in the past, uh, prior to DCD, we would manage for cold water operations through the river outlets. I think on our tour, we saw, uh, we were started releasing out of the uh, river outlets. That had to do with a, a, a power issue, not necessarily a, uh, a generation issue. So in the TCD, you can see we have different levels of, uh, of uh, withdrawal and uh, and then the side gate, which is pulls from the deepest part, and more in the center line, cooler where the cooler part of the lake is in the near the deepest part. Here's a picture of the TCE. This is the actually the picture of the outlet structure. Uh, these are the basically the trash racks preventing debris to enter into the river outlets, and the big drum gates, still the gates on the top. And over to the right is the TCD. There's a closer picture of the TCD. So TCD, um, basically a big box on the face of the dam uh, with upper level gates on top, um, middle level gates, and then lower gates. And then the side gates are basically this huge structure is being hung um, by cables. It's again, it's another box. And it's open at the bottom of that box. It allows cold water to come up into that box into the side gates. So, which are way uh, down at the lower end of the reservoir, extremely low. So, you can actually pull water lower than where the penstocks are, pull water up from the deepest part of the lake. So, what, what does it look like um, in terms of flows? Uh, you can see here, this is a, a chart showing Keswick release. Obviously in the in a winter time when you have uh, wet years, you have high flood releases uh, in the winter and then uh, a little bit lower releases in, in drier periods. You're trying to conserve that storage. And then the dotted line shows similar for year types, what the temperature of the water is. So obviously as the season warms up, those Keswick releases warm up as we move through the, the season. It tends to be drier years or warmer. Other things we have to consider is uh, moving downstream. What uh, we have during the seasonal uh, across the bottom and then looking at how the change in temperature through uh, uh, below Keswick. And you can see the further you move downstream, the the uh, the more effect on weather has on the those releases. Just a general trend. It's more nothing specific, but just more general trends that we have to consider. All right. So getting into cold water pool management. So we kind of just talked about kind of the setting the stage here. Now. Uh, what specifically do we have to operate to? So it kind of goes back to water rights order. This is State Water Resource Control Board back in 1990. It really it was the start of that temperature management. You're you're now you're gonna you're gonna create the formation of this group, the Sac River Temperature Task Group. It's an interagency group. It's an official group, um, and we're going to um, collectively look at uh, managing. Uh, the objective of the Sac River uh, and Trinity as well. So it set uh, temperature compliance 
And basically it said, you're gonna to try to start as further downstream as possible. Keep in mind that this was right about the time with the Red Buff Diversion Dam was still in. Um, it was kind of on its way out uh, in terms of removal of the Diversion Dam, but uh, that Diversion Dam was still in place and still in, in use. So as we're moving in through time in the 90s, Central Valley Improvement Act came along. So there's a big push more for environmental uh, enhancement. And then 2000 was a big, big, big change on the Trinity. That was a uh, uh, prior to, to 2000, we basically released a, a, a constant uh, two, uh, 340,000 acre feet roughly. But now we're looking at a, a range from 370 up to in a wetter year, 815,000 acre feet. Uh, uh, release down the down the Trinity. So that has a big impact on operation of the SAC side. So uh, Trinity Water, that diversion and, and power, uh, Trinity Water diversion, um, now we've, we've got more concern on the Trinity River. And so um, that has to be factored in and taken into account when uh, you're planning your, your seasonal operations. And then finally, what we're operating to now uh, the latest uh, record of uh, long-term operation um, and uh, the 2019 uh, biological opinion. And what does that entail? Basically, it sets up uh, a summer cold water pool management strategy, uh, looking at a tier system. Uh, in a really good year, where you have, a, like last year, tier one year, you're trying to operate for 53 and a half degrees at uh, CCR gates at Clear Creek, uh, just, just at the Clear Creek, when Clear Creek comes in. So, and then a really dry year, tier four year, you got to get together and you got to figure out what's best, what you can do. You got a really small cold water pool. Um, maybe you have to make adjustments. And you'll see when we get later in the presentation, what are those types of adjustments you can make and what, and then somewhere in between tier, tier two or tier three, uh, we're, we're gonna start talking about, maybe we can't, we can't meet that 53 and a half degrees. So maybe we need to uh, uh, operate a little bit later in the season or kind of focus on the middle point of that spawning period and if that critical period and then work our way out and how much cold water pool that we have so we can either increase the temperature or increase the the, the location. In some cases, we move the compliance point up from Clear Creek up uh, closer to Keswick. All right, what are the considerations? Uh, spring pulse flow operations, I think we're we we just implemented just today uh, the second of potentially three pulses this year, um, so that's helping to put push water out through the system, trying to help survival. We talked about I think a little bit earlier about uh, increasing survival and uh, getting the fish out. So that's the the focus on that. So, but there's trade offs, right? Um, so we can do spring pulls, but what, how is that going to impact impact the cold water pool? We look at flow management and in the fall uh, when we're trying to ramp down for flows, but uh, downstream, maybe there's a need for water for rice decomp. They're gonna um, try to flood up their fields to help that straw decompose. But we're trying to get water down to release to try to store for next year now. So our focus is next year. So there's that trade-off between trying to get down, um, release enough for, for downstream needs, and then, um, Trying to prevent from dewatering any any late uh, late winter run that are still haven't emerged yet, and then uh, drought operations like we, like a, maybe a tier four year. What can we do in a drought? If you got a major drought, you don't have uh, the water to to really meet uh, all those requirements that you wish you could. So what what can we do? So there's things like uh, we try to bypass power. So in a, in a year, I think it was a couple of years ago, we're in the drought where it was early in the season. Uh, we wanted to conserve cold water. The reservoir is really low. 
Um, we want to release as warm a water as possible. So instead of moving it through the powerhouse, we released it through the, the outlet works. So it just allowed us to uh, delay uh, opening a, a lower gate on the TCD. So there was a trade off there. It, it was a power bypass. So um, things like that, um, the ur temporary ur urgency change position. So going to the board and saying we can't meet uh, the requirements. Um, maybe it could be downstream delta requirements. We've got concerns with warm water pool. Can we di shift diver diversions? And then uh, in a few years ago, even the, the senior water rights, the settlement contractors took a huge hit. They went way lower than they, uh, the, uh, our agreements are with them. Uh, they kind of uh, thought that to realize that the this was a bigger bigger than them. Uh, that it, it was a huge impact to diverters. That uh, we reduced releases to an extent to try to extend that cold water pool. Thank you. And make it last. So it it was a it was very large reduction for for the water users downstream. All right, we don't do anything in a bubble, so we're coordinating with uh, as many uh, uh, agencies and stakeholders as possible. There's a, it's a, probably not a complete list, um, but quite a, quite a few um, that you're probably familiar with. Um, even the little guys, like the local system operators, like ACID here in Reading, uh, we've got to coordinate with them too. You just a little, they're the little guys, but in still they've got a, 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 a diversion dam to install in the river. So we've got to juggle pulse flows with them getting in out in the river and safety concerns. So there's a lot of juggling that goes on with a lot of different things. All right, just kind of a little bit of a hierarchy and, and uh, where things fit in. So Sac River temperature task group, you can see. Um, there's even a subgroup, Upper Sac Scheduling Team. They uh, they pr primarily talk about uh, pulse flows, both in the spring and then in uh, in the fall. Report to the Sacramento Temp Task Group. If there's an issue that uh, can't be resolved to the SRTTG, it goes to the Shasta Planning Group. It's very similar to the Water Operations Team. And then obviously all of that can't be uh, uh, figured out, it goes up even higher to the directors of the agencies. And you can see there's also other uh, water operations groups for the different tributaries. All right, so what does SRTTG do? Coordinate temperature management. So, so that's the primary function. Uh, and then we develop together a seasonal temperature management plan. It's for one season. And then I talked about upper sack schedule meeting. What does the group look at? Um, well, there's lots, obviously, lots of things to consider. So we're looking at uh, what are those thresholds at the various locations downstream? Like, is it a tier one, tier two? Can we, can we modify that? Are there things that uh, we need to look at? Uh, the group uh, decides uh, what are those meteorological um, exceedances that we want to look at for to the weather for the for the summer months. Uh, so we started looking at alternatives, trade offs. Uh, for instance, uh, power bypassing power to do a warm water bypass that was uh, evaluated a few years ago. And then we started looking at performance measures. What are the what are the trade offs? What are the what are the uh, the metrics downstream? What are where are you going to be impacted? Obviously, when we did a power analysis, there was a reduction in power generation, and then th that might lead to other uh, issues uh, uh, down the road in terms of uh, the dirtier power that would have to be generated to supplement that cleaner hydropower that was uh, offline. All right, some of the trade-offs we look at, like we mentioned before in the tier system, how do we uh, manage uh, the early season versus maybe the late season? You know, we could we could operate early in the year and release a lot of cold water, but what is that gonna do later in the year? 
maybe we'll run out. So those are the kind of things that we're that SRTG is looking at. So the temperature management plan process, um, we've uh, just like this year, we just uh, started a draft temperature management plan based on April. Uh, so the final plan will be finalized uh, late May. And then we're looking at, uh, we we set up set a plan and then we have things that we uh, monitor. And then uh, at the end of the year, um, we'll we'll actually look back and do a hindcast uh, at the end of the year to see you know where where could we have improved things or where there was errors in the system. So normally we've got so we did talk about you know uh, unusual conditions where uh, maybe uh, there's a tier four year where you have to basically say hey this is so dry this year it is such a small cold water pool we're gonna have to look outside the box and those issues like uh, do we need a temporary urgency change position that sort of thing but normally um, we're we're starting off with a, a 12 month look out this comes from our office uh, every month we sit down we look at all the inputs from uh, runoff. Um, in this case, we were looking at a 50% exceedance. So we're looking at uh, middle of the road hydrology for inflow into the system. Um, this model uh, takes into account what, what those flows down below Keswick are gonna be. So there's a, there's a lot of input from the Department of Water Resources, from uh, the National River uh, Forecast Center, from uh, uh, No Fisheries, uh, or actually uh, plant, the uh, California Nevada River Forecast Center. So the, the, the uh, flow branch of, of uh, NOAA. So we're taking all that into consideration, looking at all the downstream requirements uh, and uh, flows, diversions, uh, requirements in the Delta. Again, it's not, we're not operating Shasta in the bubble. We're also looking at uh, what, what Folsom is doing. Um, what how the Trinity system is looking like. We also need to uh, coordinate with the state water project, so Oroville. So the Delta has certain requirements, water quality requirements, um, and we have to coordinate with the state water project in Oroville to determine how who's going to meet those requirements. And then there's there's agreements on how to how to divvy that up. Um, so we're taking all that into consideration and uh, based on a Based on, in this case, I have one exceeding site. We also look at a 90%, so a dry case. So, and that's what we deem as our official because obviously we don't want to uh, commit something that we can't. So, if we commit to a 90% forecast, the irrigators downstream know there's a pretty good chance they're going to be able to commit, you know, to, to hold to that schedule. So, um, and then a lot of our temperature dependent mortality and, and such, um, you'll see later that we, we've we kind of, uh, in the past, we've always tried to look at a, a drier case scenario uh, in terms of uh, what can you provide for fisheries downstream and water supply and temperature management. So, so even though this is a 50% forecast, I think uh, we generally trend to look at the 90% like the the draft temperature management plan that we just came out with, it was using the 90% forecast. So, but part of us, our TTG is to decide, okay, maybe, maybe we want to start looking at a 50% or a different forecast. So, so these are some of the uncertainties. Uh, so we're looking at the 90% inflow exceedance forecast, like I mentioned. We're looking at those accretions and depletions. There can be a lot of uh, error in that forecast. Um, so, and, and a lot of times, uh, at least in terms of requirements downstream, maybe not, it does not necessarily directly affect the cold water pool. But if we were assuming there's a lot of uh, accretions into the system from creeks downstream, that may, maybe will meet delta requirements and then things dry up. Well, where's that water gonna come from? got to come from one of the reservoirs to help meet that. So, so there's a lot of, of things that can affect in, in certain years there's, it's harder to forecast the accretions and depletions. Uh, we get depletions, we get a lot of diversion. The, a lot of the diverters give us schedules so we can kind of 
estimate what, what they're going to take off the river. And then there's a lot of uncertainty in Delta water quality. We, it's not an exact science. And the further you get down into the system, it becomes more and more complex. And then uh, certain months can, can affect other months down the road. So it's, it's a cascading effect in terms of uh, uh, forecasting out multi-months. Uh, the SRTTG has kind of agreed that we want to look at a very uh, uh, hot scenario. So um, we're looking at the 25% exceedance. And it seems like the National Weather Service always forecasts that the summer is hotter than it ever has been. So it's pretty much in line with, uh, with that. So we've almost gotten, <laughs> when we look at it with the forecast of the summer temperatures, it's always, always higher than normal. So it's just like, okay, well, it's almost becoming the standard now. Um, how is that reservoir gonna stratify? Is it gonna be, you know, you don't know from year to year. It's really dependent on that winter and how cold it was last year. We had a really cold and, and wet winter. This year, it wasn't as wet, maybe not as cold. So even though, and then last year we, 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 uh, had a really low reservoir Shasta going into the water year. So we didn't have to make a lot of flood releases. The Army Corps sets, you know, parameters in terms of uh, uh, flood operations and, and levels of the reservoir in the wintertime. So last year we were able to, coming off a of drier series, we were just able to store a lot of that runoff. Um, this year we came in with a really high carryover storage and we had to make flood releases right off the bat. So uh, so we had to make some large releases. I think we got up to 35,000 in flood releases this year, this, this winter. So and I think the prior year, I think it was like 5,000. So, so it tells you coming into the, to the year with a carryover storage has a big implication and uh, on what the, you know, the releases are gonna be. And then are there power outages or plant outages? They gotta do maintenance, uh, unfortunately, but we recognize that, um, and then there's there's also some modeling uncertainty. You know, it's not the model's not going to be perfect. It's it's just a this is this is one estimate on in time what it might look like. So we got to stress that. You know, hey, this is not the, the exact answer that it's going to be. It's always going to be something different. So how are we monitoring things as we work through the season? We're looking at uh, temperatures down through the system. Wh where are the fish in, in the river? Um, so a lot of uh, monitoring that's going on. We're always coordinating with, with the fishery agencies on, on the status. There's always a, in our monthly Sac River temperature task group meetings, we're always, uh, there's a huge component on fisheries. What's, what's going on? Let's, let's make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what we're seeing in fishery lives. So, and then there's some some CDEX stations that we're monitoring uh, all the way down. Uh, for instance, for, for flood control, we're operating at Ben Bridge and you got a lot of tributaries that are coming in there. So, uh, Flow-wise, Ben Bridge is a key component down there for uh, flood operations. But in terms of temperatures, we're, we're tracking Lewiston release temperatures, Whiskey Town temperatures, even Clear Creek and Igo. We've got some temperature concerns there too. So, but the biggest thing is is uh, that Keswick release and uh, Shasta uh, temperature release. What else are we tracking? We're tracking monitoring these uh, profiles. What 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 does the the temperature in the lake look like? So you can see this is a uh, from from last year where we were tracking. Uh, and it, when do we get into the the uh, key temperature season? We're at a weekly time step. So every week they're going out on the lake and at the same spot they're they're measuring what that profile of the lake is. Not not as important as at least in the winter time, but so we can kind of ease off on the workload for the for the staff and then but but every week when it comes to May through through the summer. All right. So what what are some of the metrics that we're looking at uh, to help us with? Uh, this is a. Uh, 
a clip, a table from our draft temperature management plan this year, uh, and where uh, one of the things we talked about earlier was spring pulse flow. Um, that's the trade-off, right? We're gonna we're gonna do a spring pulse flow. What is that gonna? How is that gonna impact the uh, temperature management plan? So we have a with and without uh, scenario here, um, showing uh, some of the key metrics that we're looking at. Um, what is that? At the end of the water year, what kind of pool are your cold water pool are you looking like? Um, so obviously that's you've worked your way through the, the winter, or I mean the uh, summer, and now you're focused on the, the fall. What is that going to look like for the fish in the fall? So that obviously is a critical time as well. And as well, and also side gates. Uh, when are those side gates? As you work your way down through the season, you're opening uh, gates as you work your way down to get colder water. And uh, the lowest of those gates, those side gates, when are you going to actually open those? So you can see uh, there's two gates. So the first is the same uh, for the 31st. But then with the pulse flow, it actually ex uh, made you uh, open the the uh, second side gate a few days earlier. So you're you're uh, you're working your way a little little more aggressive with the pulse flow. So there's a little bit of a uh, a difference. And then we can also compare the overall volume at the end of the water year. And then a biological component. What are what are the what are the effects of the fish? So we can do some temperature dependent modeling. Uh, and look at what are the differences. This is still, it's really good. It's almost, you could argue this is noise, but um, but just to recognize that there is the potential for a difference. When you take actions for other purposes, they may, there may be trade-offs. So. All right, I think that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. That was a lot of information in a short time. Yeah. Uh, we'll start with with start with Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hi, I'll start speaking loudly. Uh, some people are looking at me to write the hydropower section of this report, and so you raise that issue. And I have uh, sort of uh, two questions in particular. Uh, one is you mentioned uh, more than once that hydropower was at the bottom of the list of priorities, and so the question would be if it was higher in the list what would you do differently? And I think part of that answer should address the bypasses you talked about where you said you bypass the power. So you want to release water from shafts at a higher rate than the turbine capacity, I guess. And so you use the outlet works. And... Yeah, that's rare. That was a very rare case. Do you think, just repeat the yeah. questions the folks online, just paraphrase it briefly. Yeah, it was... Uh... How would we do things different if the uh, if the power priority was was near the top? I suppose um, not a lot different, really, to tell you the truth. Um, there are cases like a few years ago where we did that warm water bypass. That was a that's an extreme drought year, and we were trying to look at ways to to extend that um, uh, temperature, the little what little cold water pool we had into the later into the season so but those are rare i think um in terms of um, we we try to um we try not to when we when we schedule releases um our controllers based on our change order so we want we'll we'll tell our controllers uh we want so many cfs at keswick in terms of the release it's their job to make that happen in terms of on an hourly power schedule they're they're in constant contact with the power customers on what the power customers need there's a really good feedback loop in terms of uh, the power customers needs uh, and then what we can provide um we we really we really try to stay away from 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 hampering the the power customers shaping ability of, of when the 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 release is and versus um, uh, the time of day on the release that we we'll leave that up to the power customers and then the scheduling side of it. 
And you reschedule with PGD, which is not a power customer, it's an exchange at the time of day. We do not. Yeah. You don't do that anymore? No. That was the old, that was the old uh, power way um, contract we had with PGE. Well, actually, Western had with PGE. Um, that marketing plan, the marketing plan changed and uh, we developed a new way of coordinating within our the, the, the control area, the, the bank control area. So so ISO, we don't want to get too deep into the, the ISO. Power, power weeds, but um, so we have a lot of flexibility with how we schedule our generation and to meet the power customer's needs. And we're doing up after base for Folsom and then that's right. Yes, yeah, I didn't touch on that, but yeah, um, and we're gonna get into that more in the modeling side of things. But um, we, you know, Keswick is an after bay. It it every day goes up and down. That allows Shasta to 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 move its generation or release to the to both preferred time. So when people need power in the evening. Uh, Shasta is able to generate in the evening to generate power. We make those releases. That water goes into Keswick, right? We fill up Keswick. And then overnight, we should kind of shut down uh, Shasta power plant and Keswick comes down. So it's a daily uh, function of Keswick every day. So those regulating reservoirs um, are good and bad because you'll see in modeling for there's a heap, you know, there's a a lot of heat that that comes into that lake that warms up that lake, but from a power operation standpoint, it's great to have that uh, flexibility because you're able to. to uh, otherwise, you'd be you would be going up and down on the river every day. So having that regulated reservoir is a really good uh, thing in terms of power power generation. We have Nimbus on Folsom, and, and I think San Luis or on uh, New Malone's, we have, there's even, uh, New Malone's is even a little different. There's Tulloch Reservoir, which is a little bigger, and it's operated by a, a different agency, not us, but um, they use that for, it, it, it's kind of a regulating reservoir as well there. So, and then there's Goodwin Dam, it's even below, that uh, regulates the reservoir for diverters. So, before Thank it actually... Uh, Thanks is, very much, good talk. Yeah, thanks, and we we'll go to Joe, and then Mo, and then we'll break for lunch. And, uh, okay, just talk. Uh, yeah, if you just talk, okay, and yeah. then so Tom's thanks for the nice talk, and good to see all the the, the selective withdrawal from different levels. So when we went in yesterday, the ports were not operating. So coming back, one port was operating, so they yeah. were, were selective withdrawal. So when I saw this, it just stuck me holy moly that this is a recipe. For ARC interactions, when I measure, you know, the high wind speed, the ARC interactions, and as soon as you the pipe flow comes out in a two phase flow, the temperature goes up quite quite rapidly because it's it's uh, it's uh, every twelve minute flow the AI will be in train uh, in your case. So did you during the design process did anybody thought about having the pipe coming down from the beach? in the operator so that we don't have that mixing and temperature rise. I bet you know, one dollar mix. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can recover two two three degrees temperature if you have that you cut off that turbulence and take the water into the into the, the, the normal at the, at the, the bottom if you kind of sink that in so that the cold water is underneath and then it keeps on going then I would imagine that you would have you would say a lot of energy. Yeah. It, yeah, that's another example of uh so the, I guess the common question was yeah, when we were at the dam yesterday, we were not we were releasing all the water through the power plant. And so we're able to use the selective withdrawal, the T C D to to uh pull water out of the lake and then run it through the power plant. Um and then as we were leaving, the, they opened up the outlet gates. So the furthest up, upper 950 elevation uh, river outlet was open and released. And so that actually was a function of power. So um, it's a power market. It's driven by price. And uh, right now, 
uh, with the cool weather we're seeing and the sunshine, the solar is driving the prices, and especially with the tax credits they get. And so it drives uh, hydro pretty much out of the market. We don't want to pass on. So they basically charge us to generate. And we don't want to pass that on to power customers. So we turn around and we pull water out of the power plant penstocks and we put it through the outlet works. We put it through the, uh, the, the river outlets. So we, we've, we told them, okay, if this happens right now, take from those highest level of the lake. So try to pull the warmest water because we, we don't really need the cold water right now downstream just yet. So, and then as we work our way through the summer, if there's a power issue, we will tell the, the operators, okay, you know, don't take from the 950. Now we're, you know, we're concerned about temperature. We want to pull from the cooler. Um, so that has become more common lately in terms of uh, bypassing because of negative pricing. So we call it negative pricing. That means they're charging us to generate. That doesn't make any sense, but uh, that's what it's come to here at this point. So, you know, I, that's, um, and at this time of year, it's probably not that big of a deal, right? And so, um, but maybe, you know, as we work later into the year, we do pull water at the lower levels if that happens. So it doesn't become as, as, uh, as big of an issue later in the summer because everyone's running their, their air conditioning and everyone's using a lot of electricity. So the, the negative pricing doesn't show up as much. And so it's not really an issue in the middle of summer, but this time of year, that's become a, a big problem. Yeah, and like this, I think today, it's already started early this morning. So, um, so it, you know, we have some flexibility, you know, if we're diverting water to, through uh, Trinity, there's some ways to kind of uh, kind of mitigate mitigate that. So uh, we have. So my my my, I mean, more of the, I mean to keep the water cold, it's not the copper. Yeah, it, it it does. I every now, yeah, every now and then it would it would act, yeah later in the summer uh, it could yeah you're releasing warmer water into the uh, into Keswick Reservoir. It's it's minor though. It doesn't happen that much in the in the summertime where it's critical. Final word before I thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the presentation. So for the size of the cold water pool, uh, obviously there are many platforms, but I was wondering if you can provide quantitative estimates of the importance of the MPL volume versus the temperature the volume. They're all critical, I guess, that is a, one of the big things. Um, I think the biggest factor is your inflow temperature. Um, you know, in the winter time, like last year, we had a re extremely cold December and we had uh, snow down to lake level and, and it just, it really provided, uh, I mean, volume is important too, all right? Um, it definitely helps. Um, we, yes, we, in other words, does it matter if you have dry years versus warm dry years? Every year is different. Yeah, it, it's, uh, and that's one of the things that we we can't really plan multi years, right? Because you just don't know what that winter is going to do. So there, we take a profile in December, and that's right about when it it basically um, is straight up and down that profile. So it's it's the same temperature pretty much from the top of, of Lake Town to the bottom, and uh, we just don't know what that year is going to give us. We can't really plan until this time of year. Now we're starting to see what kind of cold water volume we have to work with. Um, yeah, it, it's it's obviously it's climate change. It's going to change in the future. Um, we're not too concerned about that. We're, we're focused on getting through the year, right? And so, um, but there are definitely going to be some concerns long-term in terms of uh, what that cold water pool is going to look like in the options of the future, but. Um, yeah, I can ask one more question. So uh, do you observe any legacy effects like related to multi-year antecedent conditions? I was just looking at one of your graphs and it seems like 2015, the size of the cold water pool was smaller than 2014, even though 2014 was the worst one. 
So in terms of like this you know, uh, you know, turning over again and effect. Is that yeah. ideal or is this yeah, you know, it just depends who you ask, I think. Uh I I seem to think that there is a, an effect from last year to this year. You know, there is some carry carryover effect. Um, but like last year, the reservoir was uh, 44 degrees at the at the base at the bottom of the of the measurement of the profile. Um, this year, it's a couple degrees warmer, so um, we didn't have as wet of a year. We definitely had a warmer uh, winter this year. Than we did last year, so th th there's got to be there's there's some connection there, I think. Um, so thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Tom. Again, I know you're going to be back this afternoon with yep. the uh, reclamation team. So we're going to take a break now. Uh, apologies again for the technical issues, which is why we've run out of 15 minutes. But we will come back after lunch and try and start with one. Stay on the track.